Hello, my merry band of intrepid osatters, and welcome to this episode 39 of the Sockmetician podcast. My name is Nathan, also known as Sockmetician on here on YouTube, on Ravelry, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope for all the good that does anyone. Welcome back. Clearly, it's been a little over a week since my last podcast. I think this new schedule is probably not going to work if I try and strictly uh, adhere to the same recording day every week. I have a busy life um, and it would be lovely if I could sort of clear the decks and, and make that happen so I could get the uh, uploads done at the same time every week but I, I just know that's not going to happen. I will endeavour however to keep um, <clears throat> keep uploading as regularly as I possibly can but don't expect it every Sunday. <laughs> I think that's Highly unrealistic. So how have you been? Today is uh, Monday. It is Monday the something of January. Got absolutely no idea. Monday the it's not even January. Monday the sixth of February. I always say start as you mean to go on, and uh, it's the sixth of February. Um, I can't believe it's February already. This year is whipping by. Um, it's not FOing by, but it is certainly whipping by. And I've got uh, a few things I want to share with you today. You may have noticed that this episode is called The Epic Frog. Some of you will have been wondering, uh, after the last episode, what I decided to do with my uh, stranded Fair Isle tank top. I think the clue's in the title, and I think you probably uh, have guessed what I decided to do. More on that later, as my good friend Elizabeth Green Musselman says, about which more in a moment. <clears throat> Health-wise, uh, I was really, really ill last week, and um, getting much, much better now. Still a little bit uh, clearing of the throaty and, and all the rest of it, um, but there's... There's definite improvement. I've, I feel a little bit tired all the time at the moment, and I think that's kind of a little post-viral thing. I think my, my body's just sort of getting back into the swing of, of not being ill, um, which would be nice, and nice to keep that going for a long time. I uh, am planning to go to the gym as soon as I've recorded this, and that'll be the first time in about three weeks, so uh, wish me luck with that. It's gonna hurt tomorrow, I can tell. <laughs> So uh, here's, let's just crack straight into the roundup. There's not been a great deal going on. As, as I said, I've been a bit poorly. Um, at the weekend, I, yesterday being Sunday, I went to uh, Welland Garden City uh, to spend the day singing with some friends. We, uh, there's, a, there's a vocal harmony group that we've put together. Um, I'm not um, part of the organization or anything like that. I'm just one of the singers in it. Um, and it's, it's going well, it's going really, really well. But obviously we need to get together to rehearse as much as we can. And in a couple of weeks' time, we're going up to do some filming for some promotional material so we can start selling the product. Um, and it's kind of a contemporary uh, pop music vocal group rather than um, classical stuff in any way. So we do a lot of the pop repertoire and medleys and fun stuff like 80s stuff, not so contemporary, but certainly uh, not not in the classical vein. It's a lot of fun, but there's a particular, this 80s medley that we're, we're doing, we're going to be filming ourselves up in a studio in a couple of weeks, um, and so we need to put the time in. There's only seven of us doing it, there's many, many more in the group, there's about 24 in total, but they want to showcase a smaller unit. Uh, so we went up there yesterday and uh, had a really nice time. It's just nice to spend time singing with people, and you hear, as the parts start to come together, you hear things becoming more and more cohesive and it's it then becomes much more than just being about the sound that I'm making. To start with I concentrate on getting it right, making sure I'm singing the right notes and the right rhythms and the right words and getting everything in the right places. But then suddenly things start to lock in and it's really, really exciting. I love that moment and then I can start listening outside my own head and start listening to the sound we're making as a, as a group. Um, and you hear the, the, the way the harmonies and the parts all work together and that's, that for me is where the magic happens. Um, and then I start to really, really, really enjoy it. Because then I'm more relaxed as well because by that point I've already kind of decided what I'm doing and, and got on top of that. So I can relax and just enjoy 
enjoy the sound of human voices working together in harmony. It's, it's such a wonderful, wonderful thing. Golly, I don't know who it was that discovered music, but it's certainly food for the soul, and uh, we all need that every now and then, don't we? So that was yesterday. Not a great deal else to report, to be honest. That'd be the roundup done. So I'm going to head straight into community. Um, and firstly, I just want to say uh, get well soon to Dan Jones of the Bakery Bears. Um, he, many of you will know this who watch uh, the Bakery Bears podcast. And I know there's a lot of crossover between our two. Um, well, Dan has, uh, has had uh, quite a large surgery, surgical procedure, um, today, this morning in fact, um, and I have heard from Kay that he is out of surgery, everything went well and he's in recovery, so Dan, mwah, honestly, the biggest, biggest love and biggest hugs, sending you all my best regards for a speedy and uh, restful recovery. Um, you're a big strong boy, I think you'll, you'll be back on your feet in no time, and to Kay as well. Um, just look after him. <laughs> I know you will. <laughs> so this is my love to Dan. And anyone else who is um, who's going through some stuff, I know there's a few people that I've been in touch with recently who have their own health issues um, going on in the knitting community. And uh, my, my thoughts and love and strength go out to you as well. Um, I do think of people when I'm off doing my sort of busy things. I, I, it's very easy sometimes to get quite self-centred when life is busy and, and, and constantly just be thinking about your own stuff. But when, when someone's going through some, some really sort of important stuff, it puts things in perspective a little bit. And what's a few inches of fair are knitting when, when, they, <laughs> when your health's at stake? Um, so good luck and good health to all of my viewers who are going through some stuff. And uh, let's get you out the other side as soon as we can. In terms of other podcasting, Pod Love, uh, what do I call it? Pod World. Pod World. I think that's that was my little title, wasn't it? From the other other time, Pod World. Who have I been watching recently? Well, it's been lovely to catch up with uh, Katie Lavelli, of course, of um, Inside Number Twenty Three. Now, Katie, I keep calling you Katie Lavelli because you are Miss Lavelli, but I don't know if you've actually taken Emrys's surname legally. Hmm. But you're still Miss Lavelli on Instagram and stuff, so I'll, uh, I'll keep addressing you as such until I hear otherwise. Uh, lovely to hear, I caught up with both parts of Katie's um, recent podcast about her return from uh, New York and Vogue Knitting Live. I was so, so envious. Um, I'm very much, I'm just putting this out there, I'm very, very much hoping that I will be at Rhinebeck in New York State this year. October, I think. Uh, that is my plan, and uh, I'm really, really hoping to meet up with an awful lot of people that I can't meet up with on this side of the Atlantic. So, uh, if anybody is going to be going to Rhinebeck, I will hopefully be there for the whole uh, period. Uh, that's certainly my plan. You heard it here first, folks. That's definitely what's on the cards. I've also been catching up with Eric Lutz of Sticks Plus Twine. Um, who I know went to VKL as well and met up with Katie and, and met up with Mina and and all these other people and, and <laughs> I know you had a wonderful time. <laughs> my, my heart ached a little bit. Uh, I was so, so envious of the time you spent together, all of you, and, and the wonderful things you did and saw and experienced and classes you took and people you met. It's a long way to go. Maybe next year. Um, who else have I been watching recently? Oh, I've been catching up a little bit more with uh, Andrea and Andrew from Fruity Knitting Podcast. Andrea, thank you so much for your uh, message about my tank top. Um, yeah, it's just been... It's been a bit ghastly. <laughs> but you'll see the fruits of my labours later. Um, so that's... That's that in terms of pod world. Um, so I want to move straight into, uh, while we're on community, to go into uh, the, uh, the podcast questions. There's been a bumper crop again, which I love. So thank you so much for everybody who has uh, left something in the podcast questions thread. 
If you don't know what I'm talking about, I have a group on Ravelry. Just search for Sockmetician on the Groups tab and uh, join up and you can join in the fun there. There's, there's, there's always a lot of chat going on uh, and the podcast questions thread is one that I've made sticky so it's always at the top. You can always find that one easily. So if you have any questions for me, uh, anything, it's not a knitting advice thing, it's sort of questions to me. Uh, there are other, other places where we can discuss um, help and advice and stuff like that and I, I'm not sure I'm always going to be the best person to ask advice of. My my niche is certainly double knitting but I'm getting a lot of uh, inquiries about lots and lots of different things and I, I just think I'm probably not the best person to do this. I'm just going to touch my screen at the moment because I'm showing low battery so uh, let's get rid of that. Marvellous. Um, I may probably have to uh, stop this in a moment and <laughs> and plug in. Oh, the joys. I was doing some filming earlier and I think that's what's run my battery down. Um, yeah, so I don't think I'm necessarily, I'm, I wouldn't consider myself to be all things knitting guru by any stretch of the imagination. Um, if I can help, I'll be happy to do so, but uh, I do like to look at things in different ways. Um, but I, I think if you've got any real knitting queries that sort of are not related to double knitting, you're probably better off addressing them elsewhere. Um, that's in no way a please don't contact me thing. I don't mean that at all. Um, I just think you'll probably get better help from somebody else. <laughs> so, uh, with that in mind, let's go back to... Um, here's my question, says Apple Pie. Uh, Apple Pie, your name is, I haven't checked this in advance, oh, Elaine from Hampshire. You're not very far away, Elaine. Um, right, here's my question, and sorry if it's been asked before. How do you feel, slash get on, knitting in public? I'm fine on trains, but feel very self-conscious in a cafe or park, etc. It'd be great to hear if you've had any experience with this. Well, I knit in public all the time. Um, it depends what I'm knitting. I'd, uh, only really if it's something portable. Um, the, the Fair Isle tank top has not been uh, out of a house just because there's lots of balls of yarn uh, there's two attached to at any point it's a bit of a faff but um, socks definitely and scarves as well uh, double knitting scarves very very happy out knitting those in public um, particularly if it's a very easy pattern repeat and I'm not having to be a slave to the chart I don't tend to print my charts off I'll, um, I'll have them all on the iPad screen here um, so if I'm knitting on the tube, I don't really want to be having my iPad balanced on my lap, although I have done that. Um, but yeah, I, I knit all over the place and uh, I used to get really embarrassed about it, or not embarrassed, but sort of nervous really of, of what people's reactions are going to be. Now I don't care. Um, it often gets a lot of, it draws a lot of attention, most definitely. Um, I think it's it's something unusual and it's something interesting for people to look at and I'm quite happy to to be that person I've already got a big beard that that draws a lot of attention um, so to add to that the, the knitting thing uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of used to people looking at me um, and, and people do come over and talk to me and, and ask questions I'd rather people spoke to me than just sort of talked about me in a very sort of obvious way you can see people like, it's so obvious, I mean, completely obvious. Um, and I'd much rather people just said, oh, what are you doing, what are you making? It's a sock, <laughs> will be the standard answer. Probably even if it's not, I'll just say it's a sock, it's easier. Um, so it's quite simple. Uh, I do knit in public all the time, um, and I really don't mind. So, uh, Rupert's Land, who is Liz from London. Hello, Liz in London. Have, we haven't met anywhere, have we? I don't, I don't think... You don't look hugely familiar, but I'm, I'm wondering if we may have run across each other at a, a shop or a yarn show somewhere. Um, I have two questions, she says. Greedy. <laughs> have you considered designing something inspired by your tattoos? Well, I have, actually. Um, and it's, it's kind of tricky. Um, because the tattoos are off. I wouldn't necessarily be able to just work on one of them, because there's so many. 
there's like 74 on, on my left arm. Um, and they're not really the sorts of things that lend themselves particularly well to the grids and straight lines, sort of diagonal lines and curved lines on the tattoos on my arm. So I'd have to do something, in order to get curves, they'd have to be on quite a large scale. Um, so each, each stitch would be a pixel, if you like, and I'd have to have quite a high resolution um, version of it in order to, to get the shapes right. So I, I've considered it um, and sort of discounted it. I've, I may come back to it at some point. I, it is something that I would quite like because they are very personal to me and I like my designs being inspired by things that are very personal to me. Um, so it's a, it's a good question. I have considered it. I just haven't got very far with the idea to date yet. Your other question is, are there any books that you found particularly helpful or memorable in your knitting journey? Well, no, uh, is, the, is the answer, the easy and short answer to that. No, I'm not really, um, not really much of a knitting book person. Uh, most of the stuff that I've learned about knitting has come from YouTube uh, and tutorials. And um, in, the, in my early days of knitting, I learned a, an awful lot of stuff um, from Stacey Perry of Berry Pink Knits. She, her tutorials are so clear and so wonderful and she covers everything really from the basics uh, the basics of, of just how to do a, like a knit two together up to really really complicated cast ons and, and bind offs and, and brioche and, and all sorts of other things, lace stuff. She's Brilliant. Uh, so most of my stuff came from online um, and kind of just figuring stuff out for myself. There's a lot of the stuff I know about double knitting. Once I got to grips with the basics, there are things that I wanted to know how to do and didn't know how to do. For example, when I'm knitting the, my big Opus shawl Genesis, which um, I will get around to writing up the pattern for. It's nearly done. I just need to finish it off. Um, check it all through, um, but there were lots of lots of different techniques in there that I had never seen written down before, sort of lace techniques and things like that, and I had to figure out how to do those things. In so it's trial and error, experimentation, but not really from any books. Sorry about that. There are some amazing books out there um, and great references, and I'd love to have the time to be able to just sit and read that kind of stuff. I'm always off doing other things. I don't have when I'm retired. <laughs> as if actors ever retire. Um, when I'm retired and I have more time on my hands, uh, perhaps I will be able to go back and re revisit or visit for the first time all these wonderful things that everyone uh, goes on and on about and I know are wonderful things. Um, but no, no books for me. Next page. Uh, we have... Hi Nathan, says Arty Farty Mac, who is, uh, oh, they're all the English ones today, hello. Um, I don't have your first name on here. Oh, I do, your blog says Claire, I'm gonna call you, I, I, it's clearly gonna be Claire, isn't it? Um, from Essex, hello Claire from Essex, how are you? Uh, just up the road, really. Um, I'm an incredibly no nosy person, so I'm guessing this is the place to ask you what I'm nosy about. Firstly, I apologise if you've covered these things before. I've watched the, the last six or seven episodes, have not gone back further yet. Um, in episode 37, you mentioned that you got married and were filmed for a TV musical at the same time. This sounds really intriguing. Please tell us more. Where can we see the programme? Uh, well, that's that's my my wedding. Um, it wasn't it wasn't two things at the same time. It was one thing. Ben and I. A lot of people will know this because I have talked about it quite a lot in the earlier episodes, but to save you trawling through the back catalogue, uh, Ben and I wrote our wedding service as a musical which was filmed for Channel 4. Um, we got married on the first day that same-sex marriage was legal in England and Wales, which was March the 29th, 2014, coming up to our third anniversary. I can't believe it's that many already. Um, and uh, the whole thing, the whole ceremony was sung. Um, all sorts of things going on. going on. We had special guests, the duet from our, our mothers. Um, we sang our vows to each other. Uh, it was incredibly moving, very powerful, I think. Um, and we got nominated for a BAFTA for it, uh, which was amazing. 
and it is still available for UK viewers, so including you, Claire, um, on uh, all four Channel 4's catch-up service. So just go to all four and search for Our Gay Wedding, the musical, and you can uh, come to my wedding and you'll be most welcome. <laughs> <laughs> the other question that you ask is, in episode 38, I can hear the piano being tinkled in the background. Well, yes, I'm sure you could. Is your husband writing music or teaching someone to play? He doesn't teach. He is a composer, uh, and that's what he was doing. He's working on his uh, latest musical, which is a show called M, E M, and uh, it's uh, about a, a woman whose name is M, and uh, it's the story of his, his mother. It's his mother's life story from... Things that happened to her many years before Ben was born. Uh, so that's that. So yes, it was Ben, and you'll probably hear more of that at some point. I don't think he's doing it today, so uh, you should be okay. So, um, from Sam in Michigan, who is Vanilla Dash Socks. Um, <clears throat> to apologise, a bit froggy. Hello Nathan, I hope your infection is easing up for you. <laughs> it is on its way out, with timely clearing of the throat. I'm a new sock knitter and I'm in love. Well, quite right too. Uh, I think many people who, who convert to uh, knitting socks fall in love. Um, I'm wearing my hand-knit socks today. I've got shoes on, so I'm not going to bother to take them off. Uh, I'd show you, but... Well, there you go, hand-knit socks. Um, I'm a new sock knitter and I'm in love. Everyone keeps saying different things about making stronger, more durable socks but no one says why these techniques work. No one says how long socks last before they need repair either. What has your experience been with wearing out socks? My battery is gonna die any second. Uh, what do you do to strengthen your socks? Does it make a noticeable difference in the life of your socks? Well, uh, I mean, you still talk about all these different things that people say. I, I, I'm not sure which ones you mean, so it's hard to comment on those specifically, but, um, for me, I'm. It's mostly about the fibre you use. I think um, making sure that you're you're not going to be knitting something with with 100% baby camel. It's um, something that's that's durable. Ideally, something that's got a nylon content, so either 75, 25, or an 80, 20 blend. Um, and I think that's something with a high twist, knit on a fine gauge. Uh, the, the more stitches you can get into the size you want, the better. Um, the reason for that, I'm led to believe, is that where looser sock, looser fabric, there's much more movement between the fibres uh, in, in the wearing of the sock, and those fibres can rub against each other and, and kind of break the fibres and wear out. Whereas if everything's really, really dense, densely knitted, there's a lot less movement, so there's a lot less friction. Um, so that's one thing. I always, not always, but most of the time I will knit a slip stitch heel. Um, and what that does is it has floats of yarn that go across the back. So it's almost like adding a second layer. So it's doubling the thickness um, and, and giving uh, more spring to that area because the back of the heel is obviously the area that rubs against the back of your shoes. Uh, going in and out of your shoes, but also walking around all the time. So all of those things can can help. I tend to do a slip stitch toe as well, um, certainly when I'm knitting cuff down. Um, it's the same same fabric. It, apologies. That's a that's a cheese and mushroom omelette and baked beans saying hello. <laughs> um, I quite like doing the slip stitch toe for lots of reasons, not just because it reinforces a toe and toes are, are often an area of, of significant wear as well, but um, I like the fact it matches, it makes the toe and the heel um, coalesce into sort of one design element, which I, I, I really like. So that's what I do most of the time. Uh, in terms of, I don't think I've really been a sock knitter long enough to know how, how long these things are like to last. I'm not hugely uh, hard wearing on socks, but I also do, I do pick and choose what days I'm going to wear socks, my hand knit socks on. So I don't, if I'm going to be doing a lot of walking, if I'm going out of the house all the time, I'm going to be on my feet all day, I probably won't wear hand knit socks. Certainly if I'm around the house, I almost certainly will. 
Um, and, and I think that prolongs the life. I've also, I'm going to name it. I don't think I'm alone. Um, I don't wash my hand knit socks quite as often as I wash uh, my sh short shop bought socks. There we are. I've said it, and I have no problem saying that. Um, all my life, socks have been a, a you wear them one day and that's it kind of thing. Um, I think with hand knit socks, particularly because of the natural fibres content, there's a lot. There's a lot less going on. <laughs> So actually, I can make them last, I wouldn't wear them three days in a row, but I can air them out um, and then wear them again. And I'll wear them three times, maybe a fourth, before they, they need a wash. I'm a very lucky person, I have to say. I don't suffer from particularly uh, sweaty feet or smelly feet in any way. I'm not a very smelly person. Um, so this isn't something that necessarily would work for everybody. Um, I. I consider myself lucky that that's not a problem. Um, and I think that will help certainly prolong the life of the socks and hand wash rather than machine wash and don't tumble dry and don't felt, you know, all of those things. And your socks should last very, very well. Now, I'd be interested to know actually if other knitters out there um, are the same because I think there's, there's a bit of a, a, a stigma and a taboo about not washing your socks every single day, well, do you know what? I don't have a problem with it. Um, and I'm not a dirty person, and I'm not a very smelly person, so you're not going to come near me and go, whew, pong, pongy feet. No, it's not going to be the case. <laughs> Revolting concept, really, isn't it? But it doesn't make any difference to me. Uh, so I'm wondering how many people out there are willing to admit that they also don't wash their hand-knit socks after just one day's wear. Pop your answers in the pod, uh, in the uh, episode thread for this one. Not not underneath. I, don't, I hardly ever look on YouTube. Head over to the group on Rubbery. There'll be a thread for this podcast, and let's talk about how often you wash your socks. <laughs> let's see if we can just banish all the problems related to uh, the embarrassment about talking about these kind of things. You know me. Shoot from the hip. <laughs> Um, what else have we got? We've got Carla from the Netherlands. Hello, Carla. Welcome. Um, I love your podcast. Thank you. Love hearing about your views and general stuff, your tattoos, and of course, your knitting. I have a question, and I don't know uh, if this has already been asked, but I risk that and ask it anyway, and you're welcome to do so. Uh, here it is. I knit socks cuff down. Most of the time, so do I. And I would like to know how I can get a more stretchy cast on. Do you have any tips or tricks? A YouTube tutorial you can recommend? Well, uh, who is um, C.Q. Harkin, I didn't say that, C.Q. Harkin. Um, Carla, I don't, I don't know what type of cast on you use, so I don't know if uh, I can give you one that's more stretchy than that, but I can tell you what I do when I'm knitting cuff down socks. Um, I always use the, uh, the old Norwegian or the German twisted cast on. It's the same, it's the same cast on, it's just got two different names. Um, and Crucially, I when I'm casting on it's a it's a it's a slingshot cast on, so it's not a knitted cast on. Um, but crucially, when I'm doing it, I always hold my two needles together. So I've got um, the yarn is going around double the thickness of the of the needles that I'm going to use, and that gives a plenty of bounce. The German twisted cast on has a sort of an extra loop of twisting in it. It's a version of the long tail cast on but it has an extra twist in it um, and I think that also adds a little bit of extra yarn into each cast on stitch. So those two things together, I mean, you, you could do it with just one needle but it's going to be looser if it's around that. It doesn't flare. Um, I have no problems with it becoming too loose at all, um, but it gives absolutely enough stretch for for me to get around my calves, um, and I've I've always used it. So just search for old Norwegian cast on or German twisters. There are several ways of doing it. The, they all they're all the same, and they all have exactly the same end result. But some people will do uh, a sort of little twist of the thumb as they do it. Some people will try and go through an X, and you can wind the needle through. It doesn't matter, you'll find a way that suits you, but that's how I get uh, enough stretch in my cuff cast on. 
Hi Nathan says Pixie Pin. Now Pixie Pin is Linda from Derbyshire. Hello Linda, another another domestic uh, Shaw's question. Uh, I just adore your podcast. Well, thank you very much. There's some other nice things she says here, but I'm, I'm not going to uh, demonstrate the hubris to read them out to you. you can head over and read them if you like. Um, she, she says I have a very smoothing voice. Um, my question is, have you ever done any voiceovers? Uh, I have actually, uh, not a very, not a great deal. Um, I was the voiceover for uh, a corporate video for a lift manufacturer. So for those people in the North American continent, uh, an elevator manufacturer. Um, and I had to read pages and pages of this technical information about lifts and it was the dullest, driest thing in the world. <laughs> I have done some more corporate stuff as well, the same company actually, um, but never, never, um, adverts or anything like that. It's a difficult world to get into. It's hard to break into the world of voiceovers. You, um, I did have a, a voiceover agent for a few years, but nothing ever came of that. So it's, it's quite a closed shop and people go to the same people all the time. I think because I didn't have any experience, it's difficult for anyone to want to take the risk on someone new. They just want someone who can turn up, do it and go. Um, the master of that, of course, is Stephen Fry. Um, we had for those of you who may or may not know, but Stephen Fry narrated Ben's and my... I always get this wrong. This is the grammar rant. Our, I'm going to do that. This is a grammar rant for another time about two different um, possessive pronouns. And I, I, I learned the, the true answer recently. And because I'm tired, it's completely gone out of my head. So I'm going to rephrase my, question, my sentence and I'm going to say, our wedding film. Stephen Fry narrated our wedding film and he also uh, narrated, uh, uh, recited a poem set to music as part of it. Now we had, we had a half hour window with Stephen. He is the busiest man in the world and he really wanted to be involved in the film but he, we had to find a uh, TV studio that was next door to his agent's office because he had a meeting with his agent then he had half an hour before he had to go off and do something else so we only had him for half an hour and everything that he did including promo trails for the TV show as well um, and all of the narration stuff audio, some to camera, some just um, literally just audio and the poem as well and he had to do it all in, in half an hour so we had everything set up and we were like ready to go and then Stephen arrived and he was late and we were like oh we've got about 20 minutes left so in he came and uh, he, we had an auto cue for him so he could look at, directly at the camera and, and read so he didn't have to recite, he didn't have to learn anything. But basically he does everything in one take. And so I think we did two takes of the poem, one take of all of the promo trails. Um, we did a second take of something that's because he, he sort of went off script a little bit and he said, he said a bit of a naughty word, which we weren't able to use, so we had to ask him to do that again. But other than that, it was one take. He just delivers. It's, he's perfect. So it's a real art, it's a real skill, and he is the master. So I think for someone like me who had no experience of it at all, <laughs> apart from very dry lift video, um, people don't want to take the risk, so I, I've stopped. Stopped. Stop trying. Um, so, uh, what else? Um, Mary, who is Mary Fish, is your name actually Mary? Let's find out. It doesn't say, but I'm going to assume it is. Mary from Belgium uh, says, can you knit and exercise your singing at the same time? Well, no, I can't. Um, singing, singing properly, I mean, yeah, I could hum along, but singing in a way that I would want to be working on my voice um, takes far too much concentration. And there wouldn't be anything left over for knitting, and knitting would take away what I need to do for the the singing. It's all, it's all about posture as well. And um, knitting, I like to sit and be comfortable. I can't sing sitting down properly, so I, I'm standing up um, and obviously making sure that my my breathing, my posture, and everything, and my alignment of all the different. Um, components of what makes the singing voice happen, the, the neck, the larynx, the, the tilt of the head, everything is 
it's, it's too specific to allow for knitting to be going on at the same time. It'd be nice to kill two birds with one stone, wouldn't it? But not to be, unfortunately. Zeno Tim, or Zeno Tim, uh, who is Inga from Norway. Hello, Inga. It's lovely to have you here. Says, on your mantelpiece behind you, there is a lamp just growing out of the top of my head today. Uh, is the foot made of fluorite? It looks like that. Well, it's this one here. You can't really see it in this one, but it's a, it's a dark green. It does look like fluorite. It's not. I had to check into what fluorite was. I looked it up for you. Um, it's, a, it's a green um, crystal. That's just plastic. Um, it's a crackle plastic. plastic. So it's, um, it's a glass then. It's not glass at all. It's not crackle glass, which is why I said plastic, which is not a word. It's plastic. Um, it's a it's a solid green plastic that has these cracks, deliberate cracks in it. Specific technique, the name of which I can't remember. Um, I think it's from the 1960s or 70s, uh, and it's just plastic. It does, however, you're absolutely right. When I saw the pictures of the fluorite, I was like, oh, it really does look like that. And I had to check and thought, no, no, that's a natural mineral. This this is this is not natural stuff. And then all things thread. I told you there's loads today, this is really exciting. All things thread, my computer, my iPad doesn't seem to want to be allowing me to access this. Who is Linda from uh, Saskatchewan in, uh, in Canada, um, says... Hi Nathan, you mentioned your epic road trip briefly in the last podcast, well yes I did. Is this something you would talk about more in detail? Route, places you're visiting, have you considered Canada in your route a great place? I'm sure it is. Uh, I'd love to go. Um, lastly, if you can see the Canada, I'd be happy to show you the undiscovered but awesome Canadian prairie. That sounds amazing. However, we're doing south. We're going from San Francisco to New York um, via kind of Oklahoma and uh, Kentucky, that, that kind of route. So we're not going to be venturing that far north. We're ending in New York City. Um, I know New York State goes up and touches Canada but uh, we're not going that far up, I'm afraid. So that'll have to be for another time. Um, I will post some details of the route um, nearer the time, we're doing it in August. Um, I can't, I, it's been such a long time since we planned it, I can't remember the exact route now, but I will get on with that at some point and let you know. Um, and then uh, Jessica, who is Jessie Nitz from uh, New Mexico. Hi, Jessica. Um, she was a designer and dyer from Rio Rancho. Um, uh, my question regards your inebriated friend. He's actually, he's, he's quite sober today, I think. I think he's a bit, to be honest, looking at him, I think he's a bit hungover. I think he had a bit of a, a heavy session last night and he's just sort of, he's just sitting there trying to make the world stop spinning, basically. He does like a drink. Um, <laughs> What's, his, what's the name? How did he come about? I, I, have, I have spoken about this before, so I know there, there, there are... I will be repeating myself for some people, but I know people don't necessarily watch all the episodes, so I'm quite happy to say again. Um, his name is Aloysius, and he's a bakery bear. So he is uh, the pattern. He's Mr. Bakery Bear from Dan and Kay. I don't think Dan had so much to do with that. Sorry, Dan. From Kay, uh, Kay Jones of the Bakery Bears. And uh, he's, a, he's delightful. He is adorable. I'll be really careful. I'll be really, honestly, really, really careful. Um, his head is a little bit sore today. Uh, so this is Aloysius. He's knit with... Um, it's West Yorkshire Spinners. I can't remember. Air Valley Aran, maybe, I think. Um, which has this lovely sort of fair eyeing pattern. I was really, really delighted at how uh, the, the brown stripe went straight across his eye line, which is, which is just kind of perfect. Um, he's really tubby, <laughs> he's, quite, he's quite plump. Uh, he's got big feet, which I really love. Um, one foot seems to be a lot bigger than the other. I think all the stuffing's dropped down. There you go, that's a bit better. Um, the uh, clothes he's wearing, yes, you knit those as well, and Kay's pattern comes with the pattern for not only the jumper, um, with this lovely antler cable here, but also a pair of shorts which I didn't knit. Um, and this is, uh, this yarn was a, an acrylic yarn in the most revolting colour that Dan could find for me. And actually, I quite like the colour and made him a hat in it. 
don't think he'll ever wear it. And the scarf, um, I decided I wanted to make him a scarf and it's a linen stitch scarf made with a uh, Volmizer in a colourway, I can't remember. It's just some leftovers I had. Linen stitch I went for because it, it's really, really flat and doesn't curl and rather than have to turn the work every 10 stitches or so, I cast on I think 120 and knit longer rows. So just made it made a scarf that way and it worked out rather well. And here he is with his uh, CND badge. So, sorry Aloysius, um, you sit there, try not to fall over, will you? It's a bit tentative, he's like, oh, the world's spinning. <laughs> Why hasn't he or she got a Ben of their own to share sofa time with? Um, well, it's a good question. The real reason is, I can't be bothered. Um, I, I was challenged to knit a bakery bear uh, by Dan and Kay when Dan and I both drew in our joined round of their knit or forfeit show. So our, we decided we'd both do each other's forfeits. Mine was to knit a bakery bear, his was to learn double knitting. And he has, he's brilliant. Um, and uh, apparently you dreamt I knit a bear, no, I knit a fish for the bear last night. I th yeah, you say you, you need to see a doctor about this addiction. I think you're obsessed with Aloysius. <laughs> I think that's really kind of funny. Um, so I, yeah, I, 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 I'm not planning to knit him a fish. If anyone else wants to knit Aloysius a fish, I'm sure he'd be very grateful. Bears do like fish and all, all that. And then P.S. Uh, you're a great inspiration and a huge part of why I started a podcast of my own. Well, thank you so much for saying that. Thank you for all that you do. Well, you are most welcome and I'm really, really glad and I haven't actually had a chance to click this link yet, so I'm going to do that live. Um, so, Jessica, your, um, I'll put the details here if anyone wants to check out your um, podcast. Um, and you've got quite a few up there, so you're not new to it. I don't know why I haven't come across you before. Um, so I shall be checking you out as soon as I can. It looks like you're knitting up and dying and all sorts of things. So I'm really looking forward to checking that out. Thank you for letting me know. Um, and then, okay, here's a, here's a question. Um, first, I'd like to thank you, says MD McRae 42 Now, do we have a name on your profile? Misty. Oh, hello, Misty. We've chatted, haven't we? Um, so, uh, a little background. I've learned to knit with basic lessons and YouTube and just knitting. I feel like I learn each stitch a little better every time I pick up my needles. Well, absolutely, muscle memory kicks in quite quickly. However, advancing has been slow because the first row with something new will be cool, but the next row or edges will trip me up. I'm a technical knitter, I can't visualize, but I enjoy that following instructions create something awesome. Um, anyway, after a year, I still struggle with pattern stitches, but you, you is in bold, have helped me figure out uh, one of my challenges. It had not sunk in for me that which way I wrap my yarn around my needles mattered. I know this seems odd, but the knit stitch is easy the way I was shown, but purl stitches troubled me when I started learning. Now I purl from the bottom up because I drop fewer stitches that way. I don't know what you mean by the bottom up. Um, you have talked about purling several times and how the wrap affects the stitches. I'm now able to see the difference when I look at the stitches, thank you. You are more than welcome. Um, it's getting dark in here. I'm so sorry about this. I'll try and put some lights on in a second. Um, do you mean wrapping going clockwise rather than anti-clockwise? It, it's very interesting, uh, and a lot of people do. Alternate purling is, is definitely a thing and uh, helps a lot of people get even tension. Um, useful. Second question. Um, I have binge watched your, your podcast over the last couple of weeks or so, and I may have missed it, but on the shelf to my right when I'm watching, which is over there, um, uh, the bottom shelf, what is the album sitting there? Hmm. Um, I'm, oh, uh, there is a, it's a clock. It's a clock. Um, it, we've got a, a, it's just got a clock face on it. It's a, I believe it's an ABBA album. I think it might be the greatest hits from memory. And it's just got a clock face pushed through the hole. It's not, not a, a, a usable record at all. So there we are. Those are the questions. I'm going to take a brief pause now because I want to adjust some lighting. I want to plug in my phone so that I don't get caught mid-sentence. And I will join you in a moment for a little bit more. I'm back. 
Moving on then into uh, your favourite and my least favourite uh, section, uh, which is of course What's Tat? Mm -hmm. That's right, I said it, I did it, still at it. Uh, this week's What's Tat, now that I have the definitive list, thank you, Ms. Lacey, uh, for Christine, uh, for all of the uh, previous episodes, I can now confidently embark on uh, more without fear of repeating myself any more than the one that I apparently had. Um, this week's What's Tat, I'm going to uh, just roll up the sleeves of my jumper because it's on my forearm. This week's What's Tat is this one here. It should be up sort of that way up. It's harder to, to see it that way. So this is the Web of Weird. Now, Weird spelt W-Y-R-D. Uh, and if you can see, it's three vertical lines, three diagonal lines going down that way, and three diagonal lines going down that way. So let's uh, see what it says here on symboldictionary.net. Is that ever going to come into it? There you go. You can see it there on the side. It says here... Um, it's a modern representation of the web of weird, the matrix of fate, weird, as woven by the Nornir. Now, the Nornir were the fates of Norse legend, uh, and the matrix of fate was, was sort of their doing. The emblem, nine staves arranged in an angular grid, uh, contains all of the shapes of the runes, and therefore all of the past, present, and future possibilities that they represent. The web of weird serves as a reminder that the actions of the past affect the present and that the present actions affect the future. All timelines are inextricably interconnected. In a sense, it is a representation of the tree of life. How amazing is that? And how true as well. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the list of the runes there, you can see that they're all made from the same types of angles. You can... You can draw each rune uh, in the shape of the web of weird. It's kind of tricky. With some of them, I haven't quite worked out how it might work, but I think I believe all of them are are, are in there. I need to check on that. Um, so that's that's it really, and I th I think it's lovely. I think it's a real representation of our place in the world, but our place in our own history as well and how everything has a consequence and those consequences have a direct effect on on you. What I do today has a direct effect on what I will do tomorrow. Um, and what I did yesterday is what has made me who I am today. Um, I've of often said that we are all, we are all the product of our own past. Um, that doesn't mean we can absolve ourselves of all responsibility and say, well, it's not my fault, it's because I had a bad childhood. I don't mean that at all. What I mean is we are all the product of our own past. We are shaped by our experiences and we are moulded by the things that have happened to us into what I am today. However, what I am today shapes what will happen tomorrow. So I still very much believe that we have a responsibility going forward to... Uh, to be the best kind, just be the best person you can. Be nice to each other and do and work hard and 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 do good stuff because I think that's really really important for for moving forward. Um, so rather than just blaming yesterday on all the problems I have today, I am responsible for what I do today moving forward. And for me, that's what uh, the web of weird represents. Um, so it's about an acknowledgement that everything is interconnected, but I am going to affect what comes later and make sure I make the right choices as a result. So that's that. Now let's move on into whips, shall we? And let's talk about the elephant in the room, which is, of course, oh, my stranded tank top. The Nahani River tank top, designed by Betts Lampers. It looks like this. I, something's been dripped on this pattern. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's a bit sticky. You can see all these blobs everywhere. I don't know what it is. But this is what the thing should look like. It's a really, really lovely, lovely vest. 
uh, as you say in North America and uh, I call it a tank top it's not a sweater vest it's a tank top for us in case you're wondering a vest is something is an undergarment um, and to catch up I'm sure you already know this but I had I'd got I'd done about that much of it quite a lot and uh, <laughs> and I, I made a mistake with, the, with one of the background colours. I'd gone past where I should have done a colour change. There are ten different colours of yarn in, in this pattern. And I knew that I needed to uh, rip back. So I took it off the needles. Uh, I, was, I was about seven rows and there's seven rounds and there's like 330 odd uh, per round. So it was quite a lot. Um, but, you know, one of those things. So I took it off the needles so I could rip it out. And because it had been quite bunched up on the needles, I hadn't got a true representation of the size. So I thought, well, now's a good time. It's off the needles. I'll stretch out and measure it. Because I knew that my gauge was a little bit off originally, a little bit looser than the pattern required. So what I was doing was making the size smaller and hoping that would be enough to compensate and give me about the right size. I'm a sort of 14 inch chest. And I, I was making the 39, knowing it would be a bit looser. And uh, it was quite a lot looser. It was quite obvious to me that my gauge had changed enormously since I started on the project. Um, I am not an accomplished stranded knitter, uh, and I'm, one of the reasons I wanted to do this was to become much better at it. And the, the amount of stranded knitting required in it meant that there was time for my gauge to settle and evolve and change and it was getting looser and looser. Uh, I was really happy with it, really happy with the fabric it was making, the drape was lovely, the, the stitch tension was fine, there was, I was, the floats on the back were beautifully tidy, I was really really very very happy. It just got very very loose and instead of uh, 32 stitches per 4 inch, it was 8 stitches per inch, I had um, 27. That's a huge discrepancy over that many stitches. It meant that my tank top was going to measure 46 inches around the chest, not 40. <laughs> That's huge. So the uh, tank top has been in timeout. Um, a lot of people have commented last since last episode with some great suggestions. Uh, there's been some l lovely bits of help. Um, I was worried, essentially, that I wasn't going to be able to drop down enough needle sizes to account for that change in gauge. Um, people were saying, save what you've done, buy some more yarn and, and start again, but don't waste what you've done because it's lovely. Um, do another ribbed top on it and make it into a cowl. People were saying I could steek it up the sides um, and draw it all in so that it would therefore fit. But then I'd be sort of knitting more than I'd have to knit because I'd be chopping six inches out of it. So it would take much, much longer than it would need to. Um, so all of, those, all of those things were good suggestions, but I'm a little bit anal about this kind of thing and I really really wanted this I really wanted it as it is I wanted it to be right um, it's a lovely lovely item I really like it and I knew that I wouldn't be happy with with anything other than getting it right so the epic frog I started today and I filmed the progress so uh, sit back, if you are faint of heart, there is ripping in this next segment, uh, maybe get yourself a tot of brandy <laughs> to steal your nerves, um, hold and hug your own knitting while you sit back and watch the epic frog. So it's tank top day. As you will all know, I've been having some severe problems with gauge on my Nahani River tank top by uh, Betts Lampers. 
it's nothing to do with the pattern, it's certainly to do with the knitter's own problems. Uh, this is the pattern here, and this is what I've been endeavouring to make. And this is how far I got. I was really, really enjoying the knitting of it, really enjoying the fabric it was making, and I love all the, the, the colours and the choices, everything about it. Um, it's just that my gauge is way, way off. As I've got uh, more comfortable with the stranded knitting, I've become much, much looser. And rather than having uh, 32 stitches per four inch, I've only got 27. Uh, so the, <laughs> the tank top's getting wider and wider as it goes up, as I got looser and looser. And uh, rather than a 40 inch chest, it's now currently about 46 inches <laughs> around the top. So there is only one thing for it. I am going to have to frog it. A lot of hours have gone into this. A lot of hours. I'm so happy with the fabric I was making, the, the drape of it, everything about it is lovely. It's just never, ever going to fit. So it has to go. So what I've done, um, while I was knitting it, I was, rather than leaving all the ends loose to weave in later, I was spit splicing the colours together as every time I changed. So it's not just as simple as unravelling it and seeing what happens. I've actually got to sort of go through it quite uh, carefully, uh, paying attention to the chart as well. On the, on the chart here, let me see that, it does say, it lists for what rows what colours you need to use. Because I bought it as a kit, so I've got the, all the exact colours here and uh, I'm going to have to go unravel it row by row, marking off which colours are which, so that when I can snip where the spit splices were, um, I can then attach that piece of yarn that I've just broken off to the right colours of, of balls of yarn, because some of the colours are very, very similar, um, and it'd be tricky to find out otherwise what's going to be what. So what I've done here is I've, uh, I've set out my colours. You've got artichoke, which is the green one at the end, then green mist, then highland mist, sky, surf, uh, what's that one, storm, yell sound blue, dark navy, uh, cosmos, not in that order, and Atlantic on the end. And uh, here I go. The first really tricky thing, because it's been a little while since I put this down, is working out where I've started. The reason I had to uh, take it off the needles in the first place is because I realised I was on the wrong colour for the background there. So it's hard to tell just from looking at the chart exactly what row I'm on. So I need to figure that out, figure out what colours I was using, uh, right up to the needles there, and then start to rip it back. Looking at what's on the needles, it looks like I finished on row 7 of the chart, which is sky, and should be Atlantic, but I made it with navy, uh, dark navy, which is why I had to take it off in the first place. So I was just going to undo those seven rows, and then I realised, of course, that it was far too big. So I'm working with the colour surf for two rows, and dark navy for two rows. Here goes. Well, that's one round ripped out, and a lot of people have been telling me that uh, that there's quite a lot of problems with working with spin drift because of its grippy qualities. Well, actually, that was coming out very, very easily, which bodes well for this uh, process going onwards. Um, I was expecting perhaps to get have to get some knitting needles in there and sort of dig out bits that were all stuck together. Obviously that's the last round that I knitted, so maybe the ones that are a lot further down will have had more time to kind of felt together a little bit. Um, let's hope not. And I'm going back round for round number two, and I find my first spit splice, and then I can make the first cut.
yeah, this isn't seeming to cause any major problems. I just need to keep track of, of where I am. The good news is, I think, because of how I hold my yarns, I keep my relative positions of the two of them the same. These two yarns are not twisting around each other horribly. So here we are, back at the faux seam that runs down the side, which is the beginning of the round. Um, and I think that's the point where I need to cut out my spit splice. And here I am at the first transition <laughs> of many. And you can see, I mean, in, in this light, it's impossible, almost with what I'm looking at, it's impossible to see how the color changes from one to the other. I can only see because this section of yarn here is completely filtered together from the spit splice. So there's the, the ply there and the ply there, and the two are almost indistinguishable, which is why this is the kind of thing that I need to keep a very, very watchful eye on what I'm doing for. Cut that bit out. Cut that bit out. That's my spit splice. I'm ready to move on. So that's the first four rounds unraveled and re-rolled up. This colour, according to the chart, is sky. So let's put that with the rest of the sky balls here, so I know what's what. And looking at the chart, the next one down is Highland Mist. So that's that one. You can see, I mean, on this lighting, they actually look quite different, but in, in real life, they don't at all. So it's just as well that I've got my little system like this. Otherwise, I'd be lost. And back we go again. The ripping out is actually still quite simple to do. The one thing I've got to really pay attention to is not to tangle up my two yarns too much as I go. So I think I'll stop every couple of rounds, even though the chart says this time there are five rounds of these two colors. So that's the one, four more to go. I don't know if you can see here, but as I'm ripping things out and trying to keep one pile of yarn to my left and the other pile of yarn to my right. And I think that's going to solve a lot of problems. My counting system seems to be working out rather well. I've ripped out three of what I calculated to be five rounds. And you can clearly see there are two rounds of this uh, light blue before the background, sorry, before the motif colour changes to the artichoke green. So that's pretty good. I'm glad things seem to be on track. Now, oddly, uh, this is proving to be a little less upsetting than I thought it was. Um, I was devastated when I first discovered I was going to lose all of this lovely work, but um, it's been sitting in time out for about a week, and I think uh, having a little bit of distance and perspective from the horror of discovery uh, has been a very, very useful thing. Now I'm actually involved in the process of repairing. And I know it sounds like I'm just sort of getting rid of everything and starting again, which I'm, not, I'm only gonna go back to the ribbing, I think the ribbing was, was tight enough. And I'm gonna start again on much, much smaller needles and see what that does to my gauge. Um, but I'm feeling that now this is a positive step rather than a negative step. I am making moves to turn this into something that I can and will wear rather than something that will just sit there. A lot of people gave me some brilliant suggestions of things I could do with the fabric, put another piece of ribbing on it, turn it into a cowl, felt it, steak it, turn it into all sorts of different things. But I knew that what I want is this. I want to be able to wear this. And that's really, really important to me. And the itch in my brain, that little OCD thing that uh, sometimes triggers, means that 
I don't want to. I don't want to be beaten by this. I want to. I want to really make a go of this because it's a beautiful kit and it's going to become a beautiful item. So this is the way to salvage it, not to wreck it. Down to the next spit splice, and this one's much, much easier to see. You can see here this pale blue yarn transitioning into the green, and you can see at the actual spit splice point, I'm just going to focus on that, but there's a bit of marling where I've really bound the two colours together. It's really, really strong. I mean, spit splices are amazing, and think of how many ends there would be on a jumper like this if I uh, had just left them all hanging. <laughs> Now look, I've got this tangled mess of dark navy yarn by my side, and if I were just to pick up the ball now and start winding that on, I'd get myself into a terrible pickle. Not only is this Jameson Spindrift very, very grippy, sticky wool, it's also been knitted, so it's all sort of kinked and curled. So it's just going to hold on to itself. So in order to make this a little easier, here's my little trick. The ball that I want is at the bottom end of this pile, and the end that I've just uh, finished working with is on the top. So in order to, here it is, uh, so in order to make it easier to get to that ball, rather than just plowing in and picking it up, you need to reverse this pile to put the top to the bottom and the bottom to the top. So to do that, all I do is I take the end that I'm working with and pull all of that into another pile, so that end becomes the bottom of that pile, it's tricky to do it with one hand, normally I do this with two, uh, but then what it means is you gradually reveal the end that you want to work from, which is of course this ball. So now I can work through that pile knowing that it's all going to come up nice and smoothly. Top tip. Here's an interesting little problem I thought I'd share with you. I was just ripping back, and as I was saying, I kept the uh, relative positions of my yarns the same, so there's no twisting around. However, at this point, can you see the pale blue is caught completely under two strands of the dark uh, navy there? And that's because there was quite a long float at that point, which you can see going across the back, and I wanted to catch the two yarns together. So I'm hoping that as I whip past it with the other colour that that will free itself nicely. Otherwise I'm in a bit of a pickle. Let's see. Look at that. There we go. All free. But it does mean wherever I've done that for any longer floats I am going to have to stop and catch the two yarns up with each other. One thing I am noticing is where I've done the spit splicing, this is fascinating to me, um, it's almost impossible to see between these two colours because they're so close to each other, but the spit splice area is much, much more crimped and uh, holding the shape of the knit stitches so much more than the yarn on either side. I'm really not stretching this out at all, but you can really see that crimped section in the middle. That's obviously because as I knitted those stitches there was still moisture in the yarn from my saliva and that's really set the position of the fibres. Fascinating. Well, it's definitely getting smaller. Most definitely so. I'm into the last colour section. There's just a couple of colours of the lighter to go and one colour of the background colour to get down to this rib section. And contrary to what I was saying earlier, I am getting a little bit sad. Um, it's, it's been quite a fun journey unravelling this and working out my process and my procedure for it, but yeah, it's, there's a lot of work went into this, and uh, it is a shame to see it go. I know that it will be better for it, and I know that I'm doing the right thing. Um, it absolutely will be worth it. Just a bit sad. Obviously, I wanted to wear this um, at Edinburgh, and there was a good chance I might have been able to do that. <laughs> Not now. Um, so a year after I bought it at Edinburgh 2016, uh, it still won't be made. Back to the frog. Right. That's the last cuts made. I'm very much now down to the home stretch. Just five more rounds to unravel. And then I can start to knit them up again. Hooray!
And so, here we are, back to the start of the journey. <laughs> it's taken me probably about an hour and 45 minutes, hour and 50 minutes maybe, to get back to this point. I wanted to make sure, though, that I had my process in the best possible condition so that I knew that I wouldn't get myself into a bit of a temper or a tangle. I was sort of rolling up the balls as I went, um, making sure I got rid of all the spit splices as they were. There was hundreds of little bits and pieces of wool lying around. Um, but now I'm pretty confident that this would be a really, really good starting point. And Ben and I were just talking about it and he was saying, I don't know why you do this. He says, you know, it's so depressing to have to rip it all out. And I said, well, yes, but I knew that uh, the stranded knitting is something that I really want to improve. And I haven't really had much opportunity to, to get good at it. Um, and obviously there was a big problem with my gauge. So I look at that now as a practice for hopefully Mark II, which will be so much better. And I will be, I've had, I've had a chance to let my, my technique and my gauge settle now, with a bit of luck. So I hope it won't change any more now. It's going to be a bit different because I'm going to be knitting on much smaller needles. This was uh, 3.25, so I'm going to go down to 2.25, I think, um, to make hopefully enough of a difference. Um, and we'll just have to see. I'll knit a few inches and do some more measurements. And uh, with a bit of luck, all will be well. So there it is all gone. And here it is, as a whip. <laughs> I'm back to the ribbing. Now the ribbing I've kept because uh, this was when I first started and the gauge was very different and this fits me rather well around the waist. It's gonna, it's about perfect. Um, I have dropped down from a 3.25 needle as called for in the pattern to a 2.25, that's a massive jump. Um, it's only a millimetre, and the difference between a 9mm uh, needle and a 10mm needle might not be that much, but proportionally speaking, the difference between a 3.25 and a 2.25 is massive. Um, all I've done, you can, I've done one round. Just done one round so far. I put it back on the needles, made sure I'd counted everything correctly, got the right numbers of stitches. The joy, genuinely the joy of working with this, this is Jameson Spindrift, um, proper Shetland wool. Grippy, has a bit of bite to it, a bit of character, as Louise Scully would say. Um, it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> After ripping all that out, um, taking quite a long time to do so, when I got to putting it back on the needles, I didn't have to worry at all. I just went scoop, 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 all the way around. Not a single stitch had unraveled or, or dropped down at all. It's just, it wants to stay where it is. These stitches are like, yeah, well, I'm just here, just hanging out. Ah, oh, I can't be bothered to go anywhere. Nah, pick me up, it's fine. So I did, uh, and that went very, very easily. Now the round that I'd nipped back to ripped back to, um, had a couple of um, increases in it. So I wanted to, I just checked with the pattern to make sure I had the right number of stitches as I went along to create the little faux side seam stitches and uh, a center stitch as well need to be created. Um, and they were all still there. These make ones, they'd all, they were all exactly as they should be. So I've put it back on the needle, tiny needles, and I've worked one round. So here we are, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Here's my Nahani River. <laughs> I don't think there's a hope in hell of getting it ready for Edinburgh. Um, I am going to go back to knitting on it. I just, I needed to get back. I didn't want to just sort of rip it and leave it because otherwise I thought I'd never pick it up again. So I, I, that's why I specifically, immediately worked one round because I'm back into it. And I was pleasantly surprised that uh, a that the ripping wasn't as bad as I was expecting it to be I thought it might have all felted together and been a real, real nightmare um, but b that the needles don't feel ridiculously tiny um, I'm used to working with this kind of size needle for socks anyway um, so it's not a problem so that's definitely the plan um, let's get back into it as soon as I can so there we are that's my whip <laughs>
It is depressing. It is depressing, but I know it's for the best. I absolutely know it's for the best. Onwards, onto nicer and more satisfying whips at the moment. Uh, the Il Barato scarf has had quite a lot of attention, and I'm very, very happy with how things are, are going with this. It's getting longer. It's definitely uh, turning into something more and more fabulous. I'm getting to the stage where I need to start weaving some ends in. I don't want to just do a few at a time, I think. Um, I, I don't want to get to the end of this scarf and have this many ends to weave in all the way along. So there's a lot of colour changes here. I guess I could be carrying things up the top, but I never know, up the side, sorry, I never know when I'm going to use the next one. I'm choosing the colours pretty much at random from my, my group of four. Um, my group of, oh, you can't really see that at all, can you? My group of four colours in there, so I'm not going off-piste, but I'm just choosing whatever combination I think looks nicest next. Um, slightly based on what's gone before, or the, the intricacy of the pattern requiring like high contrast or not needing so much. Um, so there's a bit of thought going into it, but it's fairly random. Um, but last time I showed you, I think I was about here, so I've worked all of this. I finished this blue and yellow section, which is really lovely. Then there's this tiny little section of burgundy and yellow, which looks very different on the other side because of the way uh, the colours work out. So that's that. And now I'm well into this uh, orange and yellow section here. Now it looks like that might be the same pattern as the blue and yellow. It's really not. Uh, it's They're kind of similar in, in tone, um, but it, but they're very, very different. Uh, these these blobs are much bigger than only three of these, as opposed to four of these in a row. Um, and the reason why they're next to each other is that's the, the order that the patterns appeared in the book that I got them from, and I didn't want to mess with that. So I wanted to, to keep preserve the integrity as much as I could of the original book and its layout. I have made some uh, executive decisions and taken some liberties with a couple of things, but um, I saw no reason to change that. Now I'm looking at this, my gauge is not as even as I'd like it to be, <laughs> to be honest. Um, usually with, with double knitting, I, I feel that I get perfect stocking stitch, really nice and flat. I'm just give it a, a bit of a stretch. Um, but I've, I'm noticing that there are some stitches which are sort of popping out as being quite large. I don't know why that is. It's something I'm going to... See yeah, that's catching the light there. I'm going to have to look out for that and see see what might be causing that as a problem. I'm maybe, maybe just not taking quite enough care over it. But it's a minor issue. Um, ever the quest for perfect tension, as, as knitters know. But I'm really, really, really enjoying it. Um, looking at the chart, I have reached... I can tell you how many... Uh, rows I've done so far, I have, I'm on, no, 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 go on. I'm currently on row, have I got to that bit yet? Yes, I've just done row 339, and there are, if I scroll up to the top, there are 718, so I'm very nearly halfway, it's going to be a long scarf. Um, I'm certainly okay with that. It's already three feet long. It's going to be a seven-footer, I think. Um, and it's just beautiful. Just absolutely beautiful. And I love it. I love it with all my heart. So, uh, yeah, next time you see it, hopefully there will be a lot more ends woven in, and that will be uh, something that I'll have tidied up quite a lot. Uh, and then I'll be a, little long, a bit further into the pattern, maybe as much as halfway, so it shouldn't take me too long to get to, what was it, did I say 718? That would be 359, so I've got another 20 round, twenty rows to go before I'm halfway. Um, suddenly seems like quite a large project, um, but it's fingering weight, it's double knit scarf, I want it long, it's a lot of patterns to fit in, I don't mind, I'm enjoying doing it. That's it. That's it. That's all I've got to show you. I'm not knitting any socks at the moment. Um, I need to just cake up some yarn and get going on something that I can just sort of potter around with and, and do that. But what it does mean is when I am knitting, it's given me time now that I've got this one back on the needles uh, and those two things are 
plenty for me at the moment. So I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I hope you weren't too traumatised by the epic frog. And uh, I shall now sign off and say that while this episode is definitely a finished object, remember life is a work in progress. Just take it one stitch at a time. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.